The Get Rich Slow Club podcast is a collaboration between Tash Edgman from Tash Invest and Anna Christina from Perla. The Get Rich Slow Club acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land we record on. From coast to coast, across land, waters and communities, we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Any advice is general and does not consider your financial situation, needs or objectives. So consider whether it's appropriate for you. Welcome to the Get Rich Slow Club podcast, where we take you from beginner to confident investor, where we can teach you everything you need to know about investing. So come get rich slow with us. Hello and welcome back. I initially recorded this episode with Emma from the Broke Generation for her podcast, but it was such a fun chat. I've decided to upload it here for you guys as well as a bonus Thursday episode. It's all about why a year of sacrifice is needed to get ahead. We hope you enjoy it. Hi everyone, welcome back to the Broke Generation podcast. I'm back with a guest today. Woohoo, how It's been exciting. a little while. Yes. Um, I'm joined by Tash, first name Tash, surname Invests. <laughs> Tash Invest. <laughs> Tash Invest, or according to Tash's grandma, Tash Investments. Yes, she started introducing me to her friends as Tash Investments and I went with it. Oh my God, it's just so cute. <laughs> she makes it such a big deal. I think I need to talk about myself like that. She was like, this is Tash from Tash Investments. She owns her own finance company. <laughs> It's like, oh, wow. I own my own firm. I just make TikToks on the floor, but okay. <laughs> I think we should start referring to our businesses as a firm. Yeah. At my firm. A media firm. A media yeah. company. At my firm. And an author. I'm going to start saying that. My firm. At my firm. <laughs> at my desk at home. <laughs> <laughs> on my podcast where I talk about Shrek. Yes. <laughs> um, I won't waste your valuable podcast time introducing you to Tash because I'm sure that you're familiar with her already if you listen to the show. But just in case you're not, it's at Tash and Bests mm-hmm. on Instagram. Um, we're going to talk today about frugality and the power of being a bit frugal at certain points in your life. I feel like as a person and as my approach to money, I'm not that into frugality in terms of never having any joy in your life and never doing the things that you say you want to do or saving all your money. Like I'm a spender through and through. Mm -hmm. But I do think that there is such huge power in having a concentrated period of focus where you do engage in certain frugal behaviors. And I feel like your whole, you know, where you're at, where you are in your life is such a great example of this. And I think it's really interesting how when you talk about your level of investments in the portfolio that you've built up and the wealth you've amassed at such a young age. Oh, I'm making it sound quite impressive. <laughs> well, oh, from call me grandma. Doing well. <laughs> your firm is thriving. <laughs> but I think it's so funny that particularly men on the internet jump to say, well, your parents must have given you that money. Mm. When like you're fully open about the fact that your parents gave you financial education, but the money you've built up has been through focus and sacrifice and knowing where to put your money at the right times and, and actually having the behavioural follow through to do that. Mm. So I feel like for people that might not necessarily know how you got to having over 200k invested in your 20s, do you want to kind of talk people through what that looked like from a lifestyle perspective Yes, and the things you did do and the things that you didn't do and Have how I that came about? told you the tomato sauce story yet? I can't remember if we've covered this already. I'm not no. sure. I first learned about investing when I was 10 because my dad and his friends were talking about money and shares and investing. And I was like, well, what's a share? And dad explained it to me with a tomato sauce bottle and said that you can buy one tenth of the tomato sauce bottle. And at the time I was like, that's dumb. Like no one would do that. Like that makes no (laughs) sense. But that stuck with me for like 10 more years until Mm -hmm. I finally figured out what investing was. Um, I graduated high school when I was 16. So I was a bit younger than everyone else. How come? I I lived overseas when I was younger and the schooling all has like different ages. And then I think my year, they kind of changed from going from January to December to going from July to June instead for some reason. And then because I'd already done a lot of the work, they just let me stay in the year I was meant to be in. Oh, cool. Yeah. So I was a year ahead, which is fun. Um, But yeah, so I graduated when I was 16. And then the whole year when I was 17, I just worked a lot because all of my friends were 18 and going out drinking, but I couldn't. That was actually really good. Hacks. Yeah. But I knew that I wanted to invest because I'd been thinking about it for so long. It was just something in my family that you did. It wasn't really optional or anything. And then I was just obsessed with like getting jobs for a while. I don't know why. I just like loved trying new things. So I was a swimming teacher. I worked at H&M. I worked at Specsavers. I worked at the footy stadium doing all the concerts and giving people cheeseburgers. That was really fun. (laughs) I worked in the shopping center renting out those little like ride on horse things. Have you seen them? Do they still have, do they have them in Melbourne? I don't know. In the school holidays, they bring these like giant electric cat things that kids could ride around the shopping center. My ears perked up when he said electric. I'm like, I'll go on one. (laughs) 
I had those. Anyway, okay. I just really enjoyed working a lot and mm. I knew that I wanted to travel when I turned 18 as well. So I spent that whole first year just saving and I got really good at saving as well. And I liked being able to kind of reach the goals. Like I liked watching my money grow. Mm. Um, from there, I traveled pretty much every uni break. So I would spend like two or three months working as much as I could and then traveling afterwards. But I was even more frugal when I did that. I would try and travel on like $30 a day. Mm. I would never fly if I could avoid it. I'd just try and get a little like buses that took 12 hours instead. <laughs> just cling to a landing gear. Over yeah. the bus. <laughs> no seats. Why would you pay for a seat? <laughs> I just like got very involved in like where every dollar went, like literally every single dollar. Mm. I had all of these rules that I'd follow. Like I would never buy a drink if I went out. I would only buy the cheapest like food thing on the menu. Mm. And that was just easy to stick to. Um, but yeah, from there, I ended up getting a job where I could work overnight shifts, which was great because then you can work unlimited hours, which mm. is so much fun. So I ended up making like 100K in a year, which was really cool mm. while I was at uni still. Wow. Yeah. Fun. <laughs> um, but I did have to go part-time at uni. So I took mm. eight years to finish my four-year uni degree. Okay. So I did have to sacrifice that as well. Um, but yeah, I bought my apartment when I was 22 and then just invested pretty much from 18. Mm. And so looking back on that, obviously that's quite a, I don't want to say like, it's not extreme, but it's definitely one end of the spectrum. Oh, it's definitely like, extreme compared to everyone else around yeah. me. Going out, you know, eating out, but only having the cheapest thing on the menu, you know, like behaviorally pretty strict. Even though that's one end of the spectrum and maybe that wouldn't necessarily be if you were like telling somebody what you know what to do or giving somebody like your best advice maybe you would have said that you would like pared it back a little bit how much of your future success or financial growth do you think came from that early period all of it. yeah all of it like comparing it to my friends at the time it was the small things like mm never buying drinks out like that adds up really quickly mm. everyone was always like how can you afford to travel and mm. also save and invest and it's like because I work more than most people mm. I went part-time to that on purpose I would take every shift that I could but also I wasn't spending that much mm. money at all like I tried to live pretty much like as freely as possible like even to go out for remember I used to do mystery shopping at grilled yeah. they give you like a free burger plus three dollars or something mm. and that's how I would like go out to eat just like there was a hack for everything and I was obsessed with it mm. it's so interesting hearing you say that about work because in what will probably shock people. <laughs> I actually massively relate to that. I mm. loved earning money. I worked in hospo. So again, you know, not overnight shifts, but I worked in um in a hotel. So mm. you could in the like the restaurant in the hotel. So there was it wasn't like the hotel opened in the sorry, the restaurant opened in the evening. It was open like all the time. So there was yeah. morning shifts and there was evening shifts. So you can get like a lot of hours in. And it's nice um, when you can so immediately see the return. You can drop one shift and you've got two hundred extra dollars. Yeah. Like you can see it so quickly. And I mean even this was in the UK on like terrible UK wages, but we used to get tips as well. Mm. So there was like almost a, a, a really immediate I didn't have to wait to get paid. Because oh, there was yeah. an immediate return. I just didn't have any financial literacy, so I just spent it all, um, yeah. which sucks because I look back and I'm like, oh, if mm. I had known what I could do. I mean, again, like knowledge isn't everything. You have to also have the understanding of why and the behavior follow through. So would I have done? I don't well. know. Yeah, yeah, you need an example. And I had never, never seen that. My parents and grandparents are quite frugal. Like one side of my family is like spends all of their money doesn't really have any investments but my dad's side of the family is really frugal mm. like my granddad would eat whatever was left over in your plate because he didn't want to throw anything out <laughs> yeah they would like argue over whether they could buy this nine dollar mayo or something like that was what all their fights were mm. about and it was really interesting seeing that play out because it was just like oh that's how you live life if you want to be successful mm. first I saw my other grandparents spending all their money and they were really struggling and I was like, hmm, that's like a poor person behavior versus like a rich person behavior. And I associated frugal with being rich. Yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah. And also it's so much easier to be frugal when mm. everyone else around you has to be frugal. Like I yeah. couldn't imagine trying to do that now when everyone else around me is spending so much more money. Mm. Well, this brings me on to talking retrospectively about what we did know and what we didn't know. You know, everybody's got things they would have done differently. And there's a lot of things that you can do in hindsight. Like if I had known, then all of that money I was making from my tips, like, yeah, I could have done something Bitcoin. great with that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but how do you think frugality can play a role when you're at this point in your life, whether you are in your early 20s or late 20s or in your 30s or in your 40s, even or even like any point in your life, really? Where do you think that frugality and a concentrated period of focus can be used to accelerate your progress? And do you think that maybe we ignore the value of that because it involves sacrifice and it's uncomfortable? Because arguably yes. it's easier to sacrifice when you're younger and you haven't yeah. had a taste of those things. Yeah. I think it's just marketing a little bit as well, telling us that we need to live these great lives now. We see it on social media. Everything is like, you need to spend your money on this. You need to have this. Like, this is what we're working for. But it's really 
I think it's so valuable to have that year or two where you are just saving every dollar that you can. Mm. Like it's easier. It's like you're spending runway things. Mm. It's easier to not do it at all than to try and do something in moderation, Mm. I find. I agree. And like, if you want to get ahead, you have to do something to get ahead. Like you can't just keep doing the same that everyone else is because then you will just be the same as everyone else. Mm. And if you really want to buy a house or invest, like doing that now and seeing how much time it has to compound makes a huge difference. Like having a look at those compound interest calculators and seeing what 10 grand now will do versus 10 grand in five years. Like it's a massive, massive difference. Mm. I think it's often difficult when it would, when, you, when there's been a time in your life when it might have been easier to oh, then decide to yeah. do it imperfectly. Mm-hmm. You know, like you see people now that are doing like house sitting full time and yeah. I'm like, oh my God, I so wish I had done that. I've got a cat now, so it's a little bit difficult, but I recommended it to a friend of mine recently. Their lease was coming up for renewal and the landlord wanted to raise the rent substantially because Mm -hmm. they hadn't raised it for for ages and obviously rental crisis. So the rent was going up and they were like, oh, I don't know what to do. And I was like, why don't you try and find a long-term house set or just bounce between a few houses? She's single, she lives by herself, Mm -hmm. no pets, no dependents. I'm like, why don't you try and not have any rent for six months and just aggressively save and then buy an apartment? Yeah. And they were like, oh, yeah, maybe. And And I mean, I totally get the resistance. It's outside the comfort zone. It's something new. Outside the comfort zone. And I think often we, for various reasons, whether it's lifestyle or you are locked into a lease, we don't have the opportunity to do it as hard as that. Yeah. And then you get an opportunity like your lease running out, which is to some degree like a level of adversity that you have to overcome. Mm. And you have this like crossroads where- like find the hack in everything. Mm. Like you can do all these things. You just have to find how to hack it. Like Mm. thinking about house sitting, I kind of did that living at the snow. Mm. Like at the snow, you think it's really expensive. You think you can't save any money, but I was investing $750 a week while I was there because my food was included. My rent was paid for. I was working like 40, 50 hours a week. We get like Sunday rates as well. I bought my season pass at the start. And we got meals as well, like breakfast and dinner. Mm. And if you eat breakfast late enough, you don't really need to eat lunch if you're being cheap. <laughs> um, so really, I didn't have to spend anything if I didn't want to. Yeah, There was like free shuttle buses to the snow. And because I didn't drink every day and I wasn't just like buying $14 chips on the mountain, I could invest that much. Mm. It's like, that is the hack. And then I didn't have a lease for a while either. Like I was just kind of bouncing around. But it was like, oh, I can get cheap Airbnbs or go stay with someone for a little while and then go home for a bit, which is like a privilege too. But just like not over committing to something mm. if I do have that freedom. Two things to say. It's funny how the human brain will, rather than seeing a drop in expenses as an opportunity to save more money, it's so easy to, it's like, it's almost like the girl math example. Mm. And one of, you know, while it's a funny human quirk, we do think that gaining money from somewhere unexpected or gaining money through a drop in expenses is therefore money to spend. It's like the way that our brain processes like money from gifts or like if your grandma gives you 50 bucks, you see that 50 bucks so differently oh, to the $50 mine. from, yeah, oh, did I, you? Yeah, I would always save, I would give it to my mom and she'd put it in yeah. my bank account. Okay, fair. Yeah. You, you were a unique I'd breed. sell it off. <laughs> <laughs> but then people on the mountain buying their $14 chips, mm. like they see their lower living expenses as an opportunity to buy those things. Happened in COVID, happened to me. Less living expenses, more money to spend. Mm. When I could have been with foresight and a lot of people could have been using that to make major financial progress. Do you think that we have a bit of a aversion to our lives going backwards in a way, our lifestyles, yes. I should say? Yes, mm. definitely. Going to the snow felt a little bit backwards mm. as well. Like I was about to graduate Going to the snow is like quite a young thing to do. I had to quit my like, I was earning like 100K back then. So I had to quit my job earning $100,000 to go get like what, 48,000 a year as a receptionist. Why did you go? I was really burnt out Ah. because I was working two jobs. So my job, you did two and a half days on, two and a half days off three times. Then you got nine days off in a row. Mm. So I was working on all my days off as well. And because it was so short staffed, they got rid of the overtime limits. Mm. So you could like kind of just stay and work for a whole week. And like, I thought it was fine, but then I didn't realize how drained I was getting Mm. from it. And we, I worked with some people who were, could be quite violent. So I started becoming really jumpy. So I was like, this yeah. probably isn't for me anymore. So I'd okay. take a break. And then I got a very extended with COVID. Yeah. Um, but like that was a bit of a battle between like, I could make, I could save and invest so much if I stay in this job now, mm. but I also don't want to because I can always come back to it. But also in a lifestyle sense, like- Oh yeah, going from ex- like living in my own apartment with two mm. bedrooms to sharing a room. Yeah. yeah. Or like my husband and I are talking about, you know, what happened, you know, we're in a rental. There's every possibility that our landlord could- probably fairly reasonably raise the rent 
a lot because we were on a discounted rent from COVID. We moved mm. during one of the lockdowns. And so we got a very good rate, I've got to say. Everyone's kind of forgotten that period of time when rents were cheap. Yes, yeah. <laughs> but they were. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll admit we got very good um, rent. So then it went up to sort of what it should have been. And now because of the market inflating, it you know, they really could probably get away with putting, if we moved out, they could probably release it for a lot more than we're paying. Mm -hmm. So every time our lease comes up, we're sort of like, okay, Panicking. what do we do? Like, what's our limit? And that means that in order to make it worth moving, you don't want to move and then go somewhere that's $10 cheaper. We're like, okay, we'd, we'd have to go back into a one bedroom apartment. Mm. And there's like, look, it's not always the solution, but there is so much resistance in almost in like, as in feeling. I think I view things as not, permanent mm. like the snow is temporary like yep. I think I know that I can change my mind and move whenever I want mm. like I live in Canberra now I'm not loving it that's fine doesn't matter I'll just yep. move somewhere else like I'm not like I kind of decided to move to Canberra pretty randomly but it's not the end of the world and I think mm. a lot of people are like once I do that that's it mm -hmm. like how, what will I change from there but you can always move again like live in a one bedroom for six months and then move again yeah this is what I was going to say I feel mm. like this point of permanence yeah. is really important especially when it talks about using frugality as an adult, when you've got like a full lifestyle mm. and bread you like. Yes, <laughs> and your sourdough. Yeah, like, or, or a routine that you like. We have so much resistance to letting it go. But if you've got an understanding that you're going to do something for a certain period of time for X, Y, and Z benefit, I think you have to have the goal in mind. Yeah. I don't know, I want to ask you about this separately, but I always remember my mum said to me once, and she was speaking retrospectively because, you know, she's had a few sort of financial ups and downs in her life. And she said to me, there's a lot to be said about having one really lean year. Mm. And it was a bit of a, you know, she doesn't really have the resources to be able to do that right now. But she was sort of like, if I had only done this at this time. Yeah, for one year. For one year. And I think about it now, I'm kind of like, if I for one year really stripped things back and it's sometimes you've got to, you know, get a partner on board or friends on board or the rest of your family on board or, or, have, or housemates or whatever. But I do think there's a lot to be said about seeing something as temporary and just, and to a degree, I've been doing it this year with trying to put money into my super fund. I've mm. been wanting for years to get to this point where I could put money in my super fund, being self-employed. Instead of waiting for this elusive point, I'm like, just start aggressively putting money in there, mm. even when it makes me feel a bit uncomfortable, like letting go a bit of cash flow because putting that in there or giving this up or every time I don't do something like get a massage or go to the movies, in goes the money. Mm. Every time I don't buy clothes, in goes the money. But what do you think is a starting point for somebody who's maybe got a big goal that their current job, situation, lifestyle, routine, income is just not going to work for. How do we mobilize in you that have to time? Be so honest with yourself. Mm. I think a lot of people aren't looking at what their situation actually is. Like if you really want to buy a house, what are you going to do to get there? Do you really mm. need to live in that apartment? Do you really need to live in that area? Do you really need to go to Pilates? Do you really need to get a coffee every day? But like those big expenses too, like do you really need to live there? Mm. Can you house sit? Can you move? Can you go work rurally if you're in healthcare or a teacher? Like that's such a good hack, mm. going to get one of those rural jobs. Yeah. And I think working out how much you're losing out on by not doing those things, mm. like being really honest and being like, hmm, if I don't save 10K this year, that 10K could have been, what, $500,000 in mm. 40 years. And like everyone's like, yeah, right, whatever. That's ages away. But it's huge. Like those small decisions make such a big impact in the future. They so do. And like setting a goal... <laughs> And seeing, I guess, what the sacrifice is going to add up to, like what rent would you not be paying or what will you, you know, actually making sure that if you're moving somewhere $200 cheaper, that the money's actually going in there. And yeah, I think you shared a TikTok with me the other day about lifestyle expectations. Mm -hmm. And I mean, good on this person for sharing this because in this climate on social media, it's pretty savage. Mm -hmm. But because, because there is real hardship that is not lifestyle based. But there's a, also a lot of, you know, I think in the modern landscape, there are so many things that are a given that we should be able to have and we should be yeah. able to afford. It's like actually going back to what do you need versus what do you really want? Because mm. I hear a lot of things these days. It's like, I need this, but it's mm. like, you don't really need that. Like so many people in the world live in a one bedroom apartment with their whole family. Yeah. And like, that's not what we're aiming for, but you don't need mm. a three bedroom house. Mm. You don't need a freestanding house. Like you don't need any of that stuff. Mm. I and tried to have someone rationalize um, their daily bubble tea to me. I was like, hmm. No. We don't need that. No. <laughs> yeah. I remember reading a piece that Victoria Devine from She's in the Money had written mm. once for The Age. I think it was it was something like, is this the end of Australia's middle class or something? It yes. was a really good article. I've been thinking about that more recently. Yes. And she said that the thing is we have to remember that middle class 
you know, a lot of people grew up middle class. Mm. I, I, I was definitely, we, we weren't and recognized we were lower middle class. Middle class used to mean meat and three veg and no meals out. Yeah. Except for maybe your birthday. Mm-hmm. And like, look at us now. Having Uber Eats, getting Ubers everywhere. Yep. Yeah. Like even thinking back, you probably would have been too young. <laughs> this makes me sound so old. But even thinking back to taxis when there was no Uber and there was only taxis, mm. you wouldn't get a taxi somewhere. No. Like you wouldn't ring up and get a taxi somewhere unless you were wealthy. <laughs> no, unless, it, yeah, you'd organise someone would be driving. Yeah. You'd have someone come pick you up in there with their backpack seats. I remember that. Like, <laughs> the seven people in a car. Yeah, or there would be a designated driver. Like yeah. when we used to go to clubs, there were certain, I mean, this was back in the UK, but there were clubs that offered free soft drinks for the DD. Yeah. Whereas it's like now there's no DD because people just get an Uber. I used to just walk. I was one of those people being let's <laughs> oh, do the we were like walks 20 together. Oh, and we were like 5 k's away and I was like, we can walk fat. No, we grew up in a tiny town, so okay. it was a long way, like but along the motorway. The snow was like that actually because Jindy, Jindabine didn't have Uber when I was there. Uh, yeah. So that was the same when like there was like three taxis maybe you mm. could call, but you really had to plan everything. Yeah. Whereas now everything's just right there. And I feel like it says, it says a lot about how easily we'll just spend some money and it's, you know, then you get into that dangerous zone of like giving up your daily latte. Like, no, it won't buy you a house, but what's it the really latte? Adds up. It does add up. And what is the latte a symbol for? Yes. You know, what's if we're buying a takeaway coffee every day, what else are we doing? Yeah. You know, I think it's kind of like, obviously this doesn't apply to people who are really struggling. Mm. And this is kind of applying to people in similar situations to ours, I guess. Like you've got a job, you're earning lots of surplus income, you're not in heaps of debt. Like realistically, you probably can cut back a lot if you really want to. Mm. You just have to decide that you actually really want to Mm. and stop making excuses as well. Like if you want to buy a house, yes, you probably can't in Sydney and Melbourne anytime soon, but can you buy in Perth? Can you do Mm. something like that? Like, can you find another way to reach your goal if you really want it? Mm. I think the whole mindset at the moment of I'll never be able to afford a house because of the cost of living. True for some people, but not for a lot of people. Mm. And maybe it looks slightly different. Yes, an apartment. An apartment. Lots of people seem to have aversions to apartments. Mm. Yeah, I think wanting more. I think we have to get specific about what it is that we want, even if it's not specific, specific. But I think even if it's not buying a house or saving up a certain amount for a certain thing, like just having some security. Mm. Or like, is that, I think it often can come down to maybe the rest of your support system or security system. I feel like, you know, without telling people my life story, I feel like kicking into gear in the last few years, I've realized how on my own I am in terms of, you know, family type stuff. Like, it's not like I thought I was going to get an inheritance. I'm not like, I've always kind of known that there would not really be anything. But I think realizing through other things that have maybe happened that, I don't have a home to fall back on. I'm not going to, there's not like a, you know, a holiday home and a couple of investment properties coming my way that some people have got. And I feel like that's massively kicked me into gear quite a bit in terms of at various points, making certain decisions that are maybe uncomfortable and a bit more frugal than I would like. Um, And I would like to do more of it, to be honest. I would like to be more frugal for a short period of time to make. Yeah. Can we make that a thing? Yeah. Frugal, frugal. Frugal months, I don't it's know. hard with it's hard with the business. I will say, um, yeah, it's hard to separate it mentally and be like, this is frugal life versus yeah. frugal business. Yeah, because I can be being as frugal as I want in my personal life. I'm really, really happy with my expenses and be like, yeah, that's really cut back. But then, you know, I need to pay two grand for insurance for the business or mm-hmm. something, and it's not really something that I can not do. Yeah. And I think as well with being self employed, that's what I kind of mean about having those like being really hard with myself about pushing money into my super because. Otherwise, I think you can burn out really quickly because if you've got a salary and you go, right, I'm getting rid of this and then I'm saving this and you kind of know that that's happening. Mm. Whereas you can put in all the work on your personal finances and then get hit with either a low income month or a high bill for business. Yeah. And then it feels like it's all not worth it or it all kind of blurs into one. Mm. I don't know. That's something I'm definitely with this. I'm definitely struggling with. Yeah. I need to step back a little bit. I know it's quite easy for me to say because I set myself up before I started doing this stuff. And Mm. I kind of know that no matter what, I've got quite a bit of money to fall back on. And Mm. talking about family stuff as well, I know I can just move home. Like Mm. my parents are in Perth. It's not too far away. Like I know that's there. But yeah, looking a bit longer term and being like, hmm, if I do this now, what can I do? Because like even talking about this, there's like so much stuff we could cut back on. We got Mm. sushi before we didn't want sushi. Did we eat that? Free cereal. Yeah. But even, yeah, I'm even putting in, you know, like I've often said, I love paying for parking. I love it because I like the convenience. But recently, no. Oh no. She's gone. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't noticed you paying for parking. No, not paying for parking. (laughs) Stop doing it. 
things like I'm going over to the UK soon. I'm not going to my friend's hens because Ooh. the money, I know I'm going to need the money for some family stuff I need to sort out. So I'm not, whereas previously I would have been like, oh, well, I just don't have a choice over that. But like, sometimes it's an uncomfortable conversation. Yes. Sometimes it's admitting that you're not being the best person yeah. <laughs> and that you've got to prioritize something else. Like, yeah. so yeah, I mean, that's kind of what, what I'm doing with my frugality at the yes. moment. She says with her eyelashes on, there's certain things that I'm not budging on yet, but I could, mm -hmm. like I could. But you also don't want to hate it either. No. And so, yeah, what are you, I guess, what are you like a couple of things that- Like, how do you gamify it? Because I liked yeah. gamifying it. Like I liked- seeing my bank balance grow. And that's really hard if you're mm. in business and you see it drop, like the going backwards thing is really yeah. hard. Buying my apartment demotivated me for so long because mm. that, that deposit was just gone. And yeah. I was like, well, I, I can't see it anymore. I'm spending so much on council rates and my strata fees and I have to pay my mortgage now. And for a little while, that took me a little bit to get back up and be like, hmm, I'm mm. excited about this again because it's kind of like starting over. But yeah. I feel like even from my perspective, I'm noticing that especially when it does mean that your lifestyle or your life or your progress or your comforts are going backwards a bit. Sometimes just rather than going, oh, I'm not doing any of this anymore ever again, just gradually almost creating those new norms for yourself. Mm. I mean, we talked about this in our other episode about um, lifestyle creep, when you create a new norm for yourself upwards, just gradually creating a new norm downwards, mm. like gradually getting used to the fact that we're not paying for parking anymore. We're yes. walking a bit further. It's good. It's good for you. Even in business, like cutting back a lot of business expenses, doing stuff myself again that was previously outsourced. Like, I feel like that's also not often discussed in business. Like yeah. going backwards a bit, cancelling my co-working space. Yeah. Doing my editing, self-editing, like adding more to my plate. And you've got to balance it with savvy business decisions. But when it comes to cash flow, again, if I'm trying to free up cash right now to put into my retirement that will grow over time, it's probably worth it's it. It's good that you've seen that because I feel like a lot of people don't acknowledge what's actually in their control. They're mm. like, oh, I can't do anything about this. People mm. are like, oh no, I can edit the podcast if I need to. I can drop the co-working membership. Like I yeah. can do all of those things. Like you can move into your apartment if mm. you really need to. Like it's not, not the end of the world. That's kind of, I think you get to that point. That's sort of, what's the word? Like a Hail Mary moment or whatever, mm. where I think I've got to this point by realizing how up against a wall I am. Like I either change what's in my control or I don't get those things. Yeah. Like no one's coming to save me with those other things. Mm -mm. So I either try and get there some way on my own or I don't. Mm. And that's a bit like, I think that sometimes can come from, which was mentioned in that TikTok about lifestyle expectations that some people have grown up. And in all honesty, I see this in my partner has grown up with things working out mm. and things being okay. And so we then, it's very normal. You expect the same for yourself. Oh, yo, I'm not going to risk that. I'm not going to ruin that because it'll be okay. But like, yeah. what if it's not? <laughs> it's so interesting, the difference between my sister and I. So mm. I bought an apartment really young because I just accepted what I could buy. I bought mm. something quite cheap. It was 295000 My sister still lives at home. She's younger than me, but she wants to buy a nice apartment <laughs> in like close to the city. That's, I think, like what, triple more than what I spent, mm. which isn't really feasible for her. But I'm like, I, my family is, I don't know, they're not super well off. They like, they're fine. They're doing well. They have a nicest house. We live in Perth. Like there's money to spend. We can mm. go out for takeaway. Like we can have kind of whatever we want in that sense. We can buy the nice butter at the Coles yeah. or whatever. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think my sister's gotten used to that level mm. of the lifestyle. But I think when I first kind of like was becoming an adult, I was like, oh, I don't, I want to save as much money as I can. And I gamified that really quickly. Mm. But even my parents used to be like, oh, why would you stay in that hostel? They'd like offer to send me money because they didn't oh, want really? me to stay in hostels. And I was like, no, no, no. Like I'm doing it properly. Oh my God. Don't give me money for a hotel. Yeah. But yeah, if you are used to that, I can see how it's really hard because I've mm. watched it play out with my sister. Mm. I mean, like, oh, well, I deserve this thing because everyone else has it and yep. that's what I'm used to. And like she sold her car and bought a new one instead oh, wow. of buying a house or investing, mm. which I thought was quite interesting. So I still have the same car that I've had forever and forever, mm. which is fine. But yeah, it's just interesting seeing the two differences. I think for a lot of people as well, it's almost like it's either that you think it will be okay because that's, you've never, you've never seen any different, not necessarily wealth and everything, but you think it's gonna be okay and you'll have those security or whatever. I think the other side of it, which I think I've definitely related to in the past when I was maybe hustling hard in my jobs and always having side hustles and always having extra jobs and bringing in extra money, that you feel like you can't do those bigger things, so you won't bother. Mm -hmm. And so you spend your money on other things because you're like, well, I have this money, I might as well use, like, you don't see any benefit to doing the other side of things. Yeah. I don't know. Like you set the goal too far away, you make it too unachievable. Mm. Like, obviously we're not going to be able to get a million dollar house tomorrow, <laughs> but then we're like, oh, well, I'm not going to bother then. Yeah. Instead of seeing the stepping stones of like one bedroom apartment or $5,000 invested in like a yeah. year or two. And I think we don't see the point of investing just $5 a day yeah. or $5 a week. And the point is you've got to build the habit now and start somewhere instead of just putting it off forever. Exactly. And then like, when you do get more, you're more likely to do it. 
Yeah, well, like going to the gym. You can't yeah. wait until you're going to go 10, di- like 10 days, five days a week. Yeah. Or like every <laughs> 10 days week. a week. <laughs> 10 times a week. Yeah. Um, you have to start now. Start mm. with your 10 minute walks. Start with your $10. 100%. Something I struggled with um, moving in with my boyfriend was he liked to spend more money than me. Yeah. And that was quite interesting because I've always had boyfriends in the past who were more frugal like me. And that's been interesting to negotiate because mm. I like to look at all the prices at the grocery store and he does not. Because mm. that's something he's like, yeah, whatever, what's a few dollars? Whereas I'm like, it's a few oh, dollars. Yeah. <laughs> Why would I spend double the price on rice? Like, that's silly. Yeah. That's been quite interesting trying to like educate and also negotiate. Yeah. And like balance, working with another person is difficult. Like yeah. balancing the household budget. Speaking of being in the supermarket, I was, I went for dinner with two friends the other day and we went to IGA after to just like get a little IGA, chocolate oh. treat. Oh, they have some things for a dollar, oh, like okay. some chocolate bars for a dollar. And I was like, oh, maybe I'll get a twirl. And because it was like all the Cadbury ones were one dollar. And so my friend Danny was like, oh yeah, I'm get a twirl too. I was like, oh, Maybe I want a flake. Like, you know, the flake is different to the 12. And then I was like, oh, no, the 12's are 39 grams and the flake is only 30 grams. You get mm. nine grams. Free. I'm the same. <laughs> I won't. I won't. She was like, what are you doing? I'm like, it's called budgetoire. Yes. <laughs> I won't buy snacks if they're not on special. No, neither. I'm not buying. Price. What is happening with the price of crisps? No. I don't. Oh, I'm not. I'm Significant not crisp deficiency. I love the Chibani flip yogurts. Oh, me too. But they're so expensive. Yeah, but if you get them when they're like half price, it's like a dollar something. They, are they now though? I feel like they never go on sale anymore. No, oh, they do at my Woolies in Canberra. Mm, uh. I've also noticed the price changes across states. Oh my God, That's yeah. That's really interesting. Some yeah. stuff that doesn't go on, because I've been watching those yogurts like too. Sydney never went on special when I was no. when I was there. But in Perth, like lots of these things go on special. Yeah. But they don't have yogurt flips. What's that? Do you know the chocolate yogurts? Mm, no. Oh, okay. Never mind. I'll look out for one. They're here. Oh, I'll yes. try one next they time they're here. half price. <laughs> they're, they don't really go on special though. Oh. Yeah. Premium. Yeah. But I'm very good at just being like, I don't need that because it's not on special. Mm. Whereas my boyfriend will be like, it's $5, just get yeah. it. You've got the money to buy it. But once you start doing that, then you just go downwards. Yeah, well, that's the thing. And then you start, it's like the other day when we talked about buying like a smoothie with your dividends or whatever. Mm. I've definitely been guilty of this before where I go, ooh, I just got $27 in my account. I can buy a smoothie, <laughs> yeah. but I don't use the $27. Then I spend the $27 on something else. Yeah. Oh. Somehow I'll have to like switch the mindset. I don't know how to do that because I think I've been very lucky to have the mindset of like, I need to save as much as possible. Mm. And I found it harder to spend. But now that I spend, I can spend more. Mm. But I've always been the opposite. Yeah. To somehow rewire everyone's brains. Yeah. It's I hard. I like to see it. Just one final kind of combo on this for people listening. I like to see it as raising your money standards. Even if that means that your lifestyle standards go down a little bit, you're raising your money standards because you're being more discerning mm. where your money is going. And we can't have all the things we want all the time. You can have anything you want, not everything you want. Yeah. Yes. I'm being really honest about what you could, what that money could be doing if mm. it wasn't. Exactly. If there's something, if there's nothing else that you want and you're like content with everything, then yeah, rock on. But if, every, if everything's content, taking though, away. Like, are you content forever if you lose your job? Well, it, that's what I mean. Yeah. That's what I mean. Whereas if you're having your bits and pieces and your moisturizer and your lashes, but you're also maxing out your savings and you know, whatever, then yeah, sure, go nuts. But mm. it's like, if you want something more and you don't have it, the first place you've got to look is your lifestyle expenses. <laughs> surely, <laughs> surely. Like sitting around waiting for the government to fix it. No, not, not going to happen. Unfortunately. unfortunately. And the housing I crisis wish. is just going to get worse. It's predicted too. Oh. We're falling behind in the amount of houses we need to build for the next five years. R.I.P. Yes, fun. <laughs> well, let's no, end on yes. that happy note. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Take control. Five dollars is worth it. <laughs> Hot hacks with Tash Investments. <laughs> But actually, do start. Don't put it yeah, off. Do. And be really honest with yourself. I'm being really honest with myself and I've had to get my head out my asshole a little bit. Yeah. I realized that too when I went to Bali and I did that what I spent in Bali. And mm. I really thought I didn't, like, I did not think I'd spent like $1,000. Oh, really? I was like, oh, it's like maybe five, six hundred. But then when I added everything up, I was like, wow. Yeah. That got there really quickly. And I feel like I'm quite mindful with money. Mm. So it's a good time to check in and see what you're actually spending your money on. This was definitely me with lounges. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, we need to have a chat with ourselves. Yeah, well, me with points when I'm like, oh, the flight's free, but it's not mm. free. It's like $200 in taxes plus the $400 a year for the credit card plus whatever I've done to actually get the points as well. Mm. So it's not free. But in my head, I'm like, it's a free holiday. But yeah, it's not. no, it's so true. And there's such a culture, I think, at the moment with the economy being shitty mm. that, and we can't buy property and there's a housing crisis and stuff. I feel like we're seeking ownership in other things and seeking, mm. like spending is often a control behavior. And so I think we're seeking control over our lives by keeping those pillars of our lifestyle because we can't have the things that we really want. Mm. But 
we're not actually satisfied with that either. It's that just like, like a Band-Aid solution. The lipstick effect or whatever. Yeah. Start buying more lipsticks. Well, I talked about this last night on my um, wardrobe project mm. call that I genuinely would almost say that the lipstick effect now, economically, where if you haven't heard of it, I'm sure everyone listening has heard of it, but if you haven't, where when the economy is down, women buy lipstick. Of course it's women. Don't look what men are doing, but whatever. I honestly reckon now it's like an online order. Yeah. It's too easy now. Yeah. I think it's, yeah, it's like, this is a whole other conversation, but we consume things way too much. And if you think about like what people were doing 50 years ago, you're mm. like, hmm, they probably wouldn't order an Amazon thing or new clothes. Yeah. There's no sale yelling at me. Exactly. I often have this conversation in my wardrobe project, well, with people potentially joining. Everyone that's in there obviously gets it because they've joined. But people are like, I don't buy too many clothes. Like we as a culture don't buy too many clothes. And I'm like, have you seen Landfill? What? It's not like, normal to have new clothes every week. No. Or every, every month even. Like you buy your stuff for the year and that's it. Yes. You should be good. And like, yeah, yes, there's a come. huge element of that that's coming from the manufacturers, but also like we're consuming it. Yeah, we don't need that many clothes. <laughs> no. Just one outfit that you can wear on rotation. I think we all need to have like a technology break. Yeah. And then we would save a lot of money if it wasn't like on my phone to mm. buy clothes and order an Uber or auto yeah. rates. So why don't you use Apple Pay? Oh. Well, I have my, so I have one of my cards that I put on there. I know the numbers for it. So I can put it on there if I need it for like, if I'm going to a event and I don't have my bag, oh, but yeah. then I take it off because it's too easy. That's a great idea. I have noticed that now that you can like pay with Apple Pay online too. Yeah. Yeah. And like hard. when I would go, I, so I started not doing this. This is when I started not using Apple Pay. When I would go for runs, this is how long ago that was when I did my half marathon in 2017, mm. I would go out with like my keys on my phone for a run and then I'd get tired and Apple pay a coffee Oh yeah. while I walked home. And I was like, this has to stop. <laughs> oh, I got a new phone recently and I didn't set up my cards on Apple pay for like two weeks and I survived fine. Yeah. I had like, I put $200 of cash in my bag and I was just like, oh, how good's cash? I don't, oh, I don't like it. Oh, I love having it. I feel no. so wealthy. Oh, no, I Because I don't like want to spend it. Uh, I just don't like the coins everywhere because I'll just like oh, yeah, forget no, no. about them in the bottom of my bag. Coins on it. Just it's holding notes. the notes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that was really good because I was every time I went to do something, I was like, oh, I can't do that. Oh, well. Mm. Yeah. I don't actually need to pop in for like a drink or pop in for like no. a random snack. I was just planning stuff better. So true. And I had a gift voucher for Woolies. So I had my groceries sorted oh. and $200 of like spending money. Yes. I actually like doing that. I had, for some reason, I had a... Um, prepaid visa gift card at one stage mm. that, that I got given for something. And it was actually kind of nice because I was like, oh, my bank account's just like chilling. Yes. And I love all my expenses are on here. It was great. Even though I just bought them with my card anyway, because I buy gift cards or the F plus ones to get points. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've like prepaid for it. And then I'm like, oh, free mm. money now. But it's cool. You can like portion out your money. And you can Apple pay them now as well. Oh, uh, danger. Which is it's fine. Danger's it runs danger. out. <laughs> True. Yeah. yeah. Then it runs out and then you're done. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for joining us thank from you. from your firm. Oh my God. <laughs> From Tash Investments. <laughs> got to get back to my firm. Yes, yeah, I'm going to do busy things. I'm going to make a TikTok or something. <laughs> Post a story. Do you want to let everyone know where they can find you just in case they don't already follow you? Yes, um, just Tash Invests on Instagram and TikTok. I have a podcast called The Get Rich Slow Club and I have a book Woo. soon um, called How to Not Work Forever out on the 26th of June. Ah, that will be perfect timing for this coming out. Yay. How That's good. Exciting. Please order it. Please buy one. <laughs> it's good, I hope. While you're there, buy mine. <laughs> yes, no, bye, bye. <laughs> On Amazon, they're frequently bought together. I know, which is so cute. I think it's really good because yours is like the step before investing. Like yeah. you can't invest if you haven't sorted out your money patterns and beliefs and behaviors. So read Good With Money first and then read my book to invest. And then you're instantly a 10 out of 10 hottie. Yeah. Yeah. And then send us a message of both your books. Yay. Okay, thanks for listening, okay. everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much for joining us. If you found this episode helpful, please rate us five stars, write a review, or share with a friend. If you're new to investing, make sure to listen to our first 10 episodes. Follow us at Get Rich Slow Club or Tash at Tash Invest or me at Anna Christina. This show was brought to you by Natasha Etchman, who is an authorized representative, 12-99881 of Guideway Financial Services, AFSL 420-367 and Perla, who is an authorised representative, 1281540 of Sanlam Private Wealth, AFSL 337927. Knowledge is power, especially when it comes to investing. So make sure you check out our financial services guides and read the product disclosure statement and target market determination for any investments you're considering. See our show notes for more info.